Well, hello all. This is Jasper Lawler, market analyst with CMC Markets. Welcome to today's webinar. And um, so we've just got the, the risk warnings on the screen here. I'm sure you've all read it by this point. I'll flick to the, the next page. And that's that about done. Okay, well, for this week, really it's uh, it's mostly all about the uh, the earnings from the US. Probably got 200 odd companies that would be worthwhile watching just, just releasing their earnings in the next four days of this shortened week. Um, some big ones later in the week, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook. So if you're trading these individual shares, obviously these earning announcements are absolutely key. Um, generally, what's been happening so far is that I would say of the earnings released to date, probably 70% of companies have, have beaten expectations. Um, that is, makes a lot of sense just in that uh, earnings expectations have been revised down somewhat just because of the, the poor weather that we saw in the U.S., and, uh, and so that's kind of um, affected companies, not even just in America, but uh, kind of internationally too, um, who have business in America, obviously. Um, earnings expectations have been lowered down, you know, the estimates are lower, and so then naturally it's just a bit easier to, to beat those lowered expectations. So the key thing that we should be looking for in, the, in these earnings reports, uh, whatever company you're following, really is not even so much about the earnings beat, though obviously you probably don't want to be buying into a stock that's missed earnings, but not even so much the earnings beat, but the forecast for the second quarter and for the rest of the year, because there is some debate, um, both in terms of company performance and also just uh, economic growth in the U.S. particularly, um, also China, as to whether... Um, you know, growth is going to pick up from being a bit uh, a bit slow in the first quarter. You know, economic is sort of going to pick up, um, or whether they're going to kind of continue to sag after after this kind of recent surge we had in March. So, looking at what these CEOs from these different companies have to say about it um, gives us a good indication. In terms of economic data, um, I would say the the kind of key information we just mentioned um, was probably going to come from, from China again because um, the U.S., it's, it's starting to look like things are picking up given the last couple of non-farm payroll reports, etc. cetera. Um, but, you know, generally in line with expectations, close to 200,000 jobs created. That things are looking up a bit in the U.S., whereas in China, things are distinctly slowing down. And um, probably something that you're going to start hearing from some of these CEOs um, in these earnings reports which is going to feed into the, you know, these stock markets and these indices as a whole, is maybe revising down growth estimates in the in the Asia region as a result of this slowdown in China, and uh, you know that is going to. It's not all just about the U.S. growth, even for U.S. companies. These international companies, their biggest growth area has really been China, and if that's slowing down, that's going to impact their profits. Um, aside from that, we have. Um, I mean, China picks uh, kicks off the. Uh, manufacturing PMIs later today, I believe that is, uh, sort of early hours tomorrow perhaps. And then uh, we also have the French and German manufacturing PMIs this week, the uh, German IFO and the um, uh, UK retail sales, I believe. Now, I'm going to dig straight into um, some of these kind of key charts here. Something I just created was slightly on a longer-term basis. And by the way, as always, if you had any questions on anything I was discussing or anything else, obviously feel free to um, you know, pose that question. Um, ideally, just a private message to me because I seem to get those a bit easier. Um, so just having a look at, was it this chart that I had? If we have a look at the chart forum here. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> okay, I'll go straight to it. So generally what I advocate when it comes to 
analyzing the charts and deciding on your trades um, for the day or you know if you're trading longer term it's, it's just starting with these longer term charts and this is a chart for the uh, the German 30 you know the DAX and what we can see here is fairly clearly a longer term uptrend as it has been with all these uh, global stock indices for the most part maybe ex excluding China perhaps maybe India um, the price has been moving pretty pretty high and but of late, we've been trapped in between this range, pretty much in between 9,000 and not quite 10,000, more like 9,000. Um, 730, I would say, is a kind of key level. That we've seen these kind of small wicks candlesticks touching on there. And so that will be the key going forward. But a couple of reasons I think perhaps we're in for a, a break of this range rather than a break of this trend line is just looking that here, I've annotated on the chart, we haven't had a weekly close below this, this trend line that's touched these two lows here. Here we didn't even touch it. Here we are touching it, so obviously the, the trend, trend has decelerated a bit, obviously, because we're going this sideways range right now. But it hasn't managed a close below there. I think that might be quite telling. The other thing, there'll be similar indicators, um, there'll be similar signals in different indicators, something I use is the RSI, and you notice that these large corrections that happened corresponded with a, a dip below the RSI 40 level, and that level has been holding in these most recent corrections, and it has again here. Now, that's not to say that this can't turn down and break down below there, but, you know, that was the touch we've seen, and now we've got this trend line, which perhaps you can see better on the uh, daily RSI, but this looks like it perhaps might be breaking above, which can some, sometimes be a leading indicator of what's going to happen with the price. Um, price RSI is also holding above this key 50 level. So when RSI starts coming up against 60 um, in this old high, and when the price starts testing, if it does in fact test, this sort of 9, 730 type area, um, if this RSA is already broken, I think the tendency is going to be for uh, an upside break. That said, if you, you well, we started on this longer time time frame, we dropped down to the um, the one day chart. Um, we can see we really are still just stuck in the sideways mode, and we'll see in a minute the U.S. markets have had a, a five day winning streak. It's not been quite so impressive in European markets, the DAX noticeably, but we've had three, uh, you know three winning days, including today, <clears throat> and uh, somewhat corresponding with this trend line that we had longer term. And you see this gap here, I think it'd be quite important. It, the price reversed pretty strongly off 9,100, didn't even get down as far as 9,000, which was this 200-day moving average. So a few indications are suggesting that there's probably quite a strong movement um, and a potential breakout going forward. That said, I think we are still in range and this this sort of nine, seven thirty area, typically when you're in a range market, the higher probability trades are to start selling towards the top of the range and to be buying around the bottom of the range. So that's obviously just assuming the range is going to keep keep going. We have had arguably one, two, three, four, five touches at the bottom of the range, one, two, three at the top or possibly, you could argue. So at some point, it's got to break out one way or the other. Um, and so a couple of technical indications perhaps suggesting it could be to the upside. Um, again, this, that is a longer-term chart, so it's not to say it's going to happen in the next day. Um, shorter term, if you're, the momentum is higher, um, given the last three days' action, if we drop down to a, a four-hour chart, Here we've got the 200 hour, oh sorry, the 204 hour SMA, and it kind of corresponds with this little breakout area here. So that would probably be the first area the price would come back down to test. More reliably would be this, which you can see is um, pretty much a reverse head and shoulders on this four hour chart, starting with this strong reversal candlestick there. So. The projection for that, I mean, that's pretty much almost on the money for 250 points, 
So if you're adding 250 on top of here, you'd be looking at um, about about the 9600. Does that look right? Which kind of makes sense that uh, prices would start stuttering a bit around this this previous high. So then some back correction might be expected down to perhaps this area. It has been quite a strong trend, so maybe even down to this breakout of the pattern. Okay. Let's have a look at the US markets. Now you can see uh, we did have this RSI bearish divergence between the, um, the new highs made in the S&P and a lower high made in the RSI, but arguably that's, that's played out here in this correction that we saw, um, and we've, we've come back up again and we're retesting this high, and we're back above the, uh, the 50 in the RSI, and there's no, no particular indication that we shouldn't keep on pushing up to test up to 1900 again. If we drop down to the, the low chart, you can see it. it it's a, it looks pretty similar to the um, the J30 that we were just looking at, and not quite as clear a reversal pattern on the downside. But again, this 204-hour um, average, perhaps we'd be expecting something. This kind of this was kind of the strong breakout. So this was the area that people would have had their stop losses and their, and their stop buy orders. And so that, that was kind of the active area, the breakout of that, which triggered this large move. So back down to there, just below 1860. Ahead of 1850 might be an area to look at. If not, this, I had this long-term level based on the, the one-hour chart, so that slash that you can see this, this strong candle here. The, the breakout of this area would also be important. So depending on how conservative you're feeling about this um, this recent move higher, you can either choose to buy higher into it. Obviously, the high probability of the order getting triggered, but higher exposed risk because obviously it could, the price could move all the way back down to 1810, and it would still, strictly speaking, be in its kind of range mode, it could even drip a bit below, still be in a range, and short term still kind of hold somewhat of an uptrend. Now, let's just have a quick look at the Dow. That looks pretty similar. Um, but yeah, you, again, you can see it's, with the indices, we're stuck in this in this range, but we're pushing to the top of it. Now, obviously we're not at the top of the range yet, so the fact that the RSI, it does look like it's sagging off, but that's not to say it can't pick up and push into this, the top of the range around the sort of 70 level that we've seen the last couple of times. You can see sideways range in price, sideways range in, in RSI. So assuming the range is continuing, this is kind of a high probability sell area, high probability bear, buy area, but just looking at that, um, that DAX chart that we were longer term, at some point there's going to be a breakout and you know, perhaps that could be to the upside. So, so selling as you do get it to this area, not necessarily a bad idea, but looking for a move all the way back down to the bottom. If you believe that longer term breakout higher is going to happen, um, you know, targeting this kind of area might not be so wise. Okay, now I'm going to flip over to currencies. Okay, let's start with the euro. Now, again, starting this kind of longer term, I mean, this, this line's a bit messy here. We don't necessarily need this. <clears throat> but I'm seeing this as a kind of longer term wedge type pattern, which would sort of suggest a, um, a move lower. And, and to be honest with you, that, that's almost got to happen at some point. But right now, what we're looking at generally, fundamentally, which is why 
you're seeing things like the Spanish five-year yield lower than the, the U.S. five-year yield. It's just because of the difference in rate expectations. In Europe, uh, the ECB have recently been looking towards quantitative easing. Um, and in the U.S., they're obviously tapering their quantitative easing program, stopping it. So one is obviously moving in the direction of easing. One central bank's moving in the direction of easing. The other's moving in the direction of um, tapering off. So generally speaking, that would be pointing towards a, a stronger dollar and a, and a weaker euro. So that would be when this, this longer-term wedge pattern would start to start to play out. As you see, uh, see that um, uh, you know, the, the, yeah, even lower rates in the, in the Eurozone and quantitative easing and you know, reduced QE in the US. Now, sh shorter term. We've really been kind of chopping, chopping around this uh, 138 level and um, it's, it's going to need some kind of um, impetus to get us out of that. And uh, this week, it could well be the, um, the PMIs we're about to see out of Germany and France um, tomorrow, perhaps. That might be because what we have been seeing is a bit of a, while things have been kind of ticking a bit higher in the U.S., we've seen a bit of a, what you might call a plateau in, uh, in German uh, economic data. And mostly just off the back of, uh, you know, Ger Germany's a big exporter and they export a lot to China and a lot to Russia. And obviously, China, we've just we've discussed, there's, they're seeing some slower growth. And Russia, um, as we all know, are seeing some problems at the moment. Um, that's the situation in Ukraine. I mean, <clears throat> hopefully it will remain contained and uh, won't affect markets and, and won't break out into some wider conflict. But there is the potential to do that, and it's already hit. Russian companies pretty hard. The Russian stock indices, the MISEX is, is down pretty strongly on the year. And um, any companies that are doing a lot of their business exporting to Russia, you've got to believe they're going to be impacted, especially if we see some tougher sanctions from the U.S., namely, uh, but also the, the Eurozone on Russia. Um, so Germany obviously are not too in favor of these sanctions just because it's um, – you know, it's really going to be doing, not been doing the, their own business um, any favors. Um, whereas obviously the U.S. may be less directly impacted by trade with Russia. They have their own supplies of oil, whereas Germany is dependent on 30% of their oil from, from Russia, 30% of their um, uh, 30 of their exports go to Germany. That doesn't sound quite right, but it's definitely one of their top um, export destinations. So they're obviously not as, as keen. So it remains to be seen whether those sanctions actually take place. I tend to think they, they probably won't uh, on such a large country like Russia unless uh, Vladimir Putin really steps things up and uh, tries to annex pieces of eastern Ukraine and then maybe Moldova and some of these other former Soviet bloc countries, um, which, I mean, it does sort of look like, look like that perhaps is happening, but you can only uh, assume that it, um, I think the assumption would default towards lesser in the way of sanctions just because of the trade links that uh, Europe has with Russia. All that said, um, with the euro, it's, um, yeah, we're, we're going to be waiting for that. Probably that um, German manufacturing data happening later in the week. And uh, we may see a continued slowdown, and that would obviously, for the most part, um, a slowdown in business confidence in Germany, um, implying that they're going to be doing less business and implying that um, Europe might see slower growth. You know, that's generally going to be a bad thing for the euro. So we may see a move back down to test this trend line down here or this, this prior support. And if this does give way, given it's supported the price a couple of times now, this uh, 136.75 roughly, also this longer term uh, wedge trend line, then you know that could spark a, a bigger sell-off. So that, that's definitely something to be wary of. We do have the 200-day as the next supporting area, and then below that this uh, 13480, which essentially you could round off to the 135. That's kind of that's kind of the main 
support for this kind of rate, upward sloping range that we've seen the euro in. Um, as far as the yen, now again, longer term, what we saw is this pretty weak candle the week before last, coming off the top of this trading range, and then unsurprisingly, you know, that was highlighted on that week. The following week, we saw a massive dump in the dollar yen <clears throat> and, uh, and correspondingly the, the Nikkei. But now we've seen a bit of a recovery. We've moved up over half of that move down. And it remains to be seen as to whether we can, in fact, break out higher from this, um, this kind of short-term triangle pattern or this kind of longer, lower from this longer-term trend line here. At the moment, it's been holding it, but we're really kind of contracting within this range, and hopefully, it could be a good um, a good trade. The background, obviously, is the um, the uh, the consumption tax increase in in Japan, and um, the general idea is that this consumption tax, uh, higher tax, is going to uh, weaken consumer appetite, weaken growth in Japan, and at some point, uh, the Bank of Japan are going to have to act and um, further ease policy. And that would be, you know, basically involves printing a lot of yen and, and weakening the yen. And that would that would be the impetus we'd want to see to see dollar yen finally break out and hold this trend line and break higher. Um, for the time being, then, they, they haven't announced it. And, and um, Kuroda um, has been quite positive about the Japanese economy and its outlook you know, um, into the sort of third and fourth quarter, expecting that the economy is going to rebound from this um, higher tax rate and the Japanese will just adjust. So that sort of speaks to not any more easing going forward. They are already involved in a quantitative easing program, but it would really need to be an, an up, upping of the ante of that program to see the, the dollar yen break out. So it's really kind of dependent on government policy, and that's why we're stuck in such a tight range, because we just don't know what that policy is yet. Um, so, dropping down, we can see we've, um, this has been a bullish turnout in that we've um, held above this, and you'll notice that the dollar yen these days looks quite similar to the, um, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and um, and you know, that just kind of owes to the the link between the you know the low rates in Japan that people use as as financing to um, invest in, in riskier assets. People kind of it's like a carry trade. People borrow borrow at cheap rates in Japan and and uh, invest either in the U.S. Treasuries or um, in uh, these days European debt. Now, hopefully, I've got okay, five minutes here. Let's have a look over at gold. Gold is, um, yeah, gold's been an interesting one uh, this year for any of you guys that trade it. It got seriously dumped last week. That day where it moved, I think it was 35 odd dollars in the day. You can see it here on this day. And it kind of made sense. So we had this strong rally since the start of the year. We corrected down just around half of that. And it corresponded with these these highs here, it's kind of from from this kind of breakout um, reverse um, head and shoulders, arguably. And uh, so then we had a kind of steep correction down from there, as namely gold is trades trades higher when there's there's tension. So the Ukraine situation helped gold, and then also just as an inflation hedge. So whenever it looks like data is a bit weak in the U.S. and perhaps the Federal Reserve won't be tapering their QE program as quickly, then gold does well. At the moment, it does tend to look like the, the US are going to continue their tapering program, which generally speaking is bad for gold. Um, so this is kind of the line in the sand at the moment. This is still this, this kind of 50% retracement area and these, these old highs, because just slightly confusing on the chart, but you can see just about as it was approaching the 50% move of this move down, then that's what sort of the um, corresponding with this strong momentum breakdown area. The price dropped off and 
we're sitting just above this 50% area at the moment. So, yeah, really these lows are going to be key. If you break that, nothing really to stop you thinking that we can't just move. Because that, that, the final line in the sand would be the 61.8, really, for to any, any hopes that this uptrend is continuing. Beyond that, you're probably looking at a retest of the lows. And then I tend to think that those, those lows will hold um, just for sort of longer term physical demand type reasons. There's still a lot of demand in in uh, China and India, um, but it's really kind of a battle of the physical demand versus the uh, paper demand slash supply um, of all the people trading the gold ETFs and and uh, the gold futures, etc. And short term, often those speculative flows will um, outdo any kind of longer term reason for, for holding gold. That's not to say, obviously, that one 180 can't break. It certainly can. And that would obviously be, you know, that would, I would imagine <clears throat> we would be a spark for a big sell-off, probably down to $1,000 an ounce in gold. You know, if you are longer term, long gold, a break of one 180, you, you know, you, you want to reconsider the size of your holding or, the, you know, whether you want to still be in the trade or not. Okay. Well, the, the the last thing I'd mention just is that we um, we have the uh, the inside section here on the platform. So I made a couple of notes here just about some uh, biotech stocks to watch for after the close today. Uh, might be worth having a read of those when you get the chance. If you're interested in trading any, any U.S. stocks, you know the biotech stocks are what fueled this sell-off in stocks recently. So um, you know their earnings are, are going to be of interest. <coughs> Um, and then the other thing will be that I am looking to add a sort of summary of the uh, economic data to look at for the week um, alongside this video and hopefully in this insight section as well. So you'll be able to see a quick summary of things looking forward. I've um, got a couple of questions here. Um, what I'm going to do is stop the recording and then uh, answer, those, answer those questions. Thanks a lot all. Jasper Lawler. Mark Analyst, CMC Markets, for our weekly webinar. Thanks a lot.